to most of you. Um, he's got an important message for us all about geobiology, the study of how Earth affects life. We've heard how electricity affects us, now we're going to hear how Earth affects life. So thank you very much, Rory. Thank you very much, Richard. And, uh, and, and thank you very much for coming along today. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many uh, people interested in the same subjects, and that's uh, not often we get, get to have that. Yeah, uh, I've been asked to mention that my name is Rory Duff for the, the recording, uh, and yes, uh, I am a, a geobiologist. Before that, I was a geologist. I used to work on the mines and the oil rigs. Um, but now I'm more interested in how the earth affects life. That's the study of geobiology. And I use dowsing as a tool to study sacred sites, energy lines, and their effect on human consciousness. And specifically, uh, it's, a, it's, it's about shifting from a focused, intensely focused state when you ask the questions to the intense aware state, tapping into the subconscious mind when we, when we, get, when we get answers. Um, I do need to, 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 to set, set, set some assumptions out at the start and, and where I sit, and, and it's quite controversial, I'm afraid, but I'm, I need to mention it. I don't believe relativity is needed. I spent 15 years with an amazing engineering physicist called Ron Pearson, who came up with a new interpretation uh, of uh, quantum gravity uh, and uh, the uh, creation of the universe, and uh, it makes far more sense than relativity. Uh, the Big Bang is totally impossible. It has far too many flaws. I can go into that another time, but not now, so that, that's another thing. The Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics leads to absurdities. There's a far better explanation with this new science. Mind is not just purely brain function. I'm not a reductionist in that sense. I do not agree that, 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 that our mind is, is just a product of the brain and that when we're dead, we're dead. And the new, the, new, the new science explains this. And it also explains how intelligence must exist behind the universe because it went on to create the universe and the new theory explains all this as well. And, and for, the, for me, these are deep-seated assumptions which have got full mathematics and theory uh, supporting it. Uh, and, and that now allows me to go on and think differently about a lot of other subjects. And that's, that's where we're learning and, and uncovering some fantastic information. Uh, an intelligent ether exists as, as, as the background medium at a sub-quantum level of existence. And, and I know that uh, Guy mentioned uh, Tesla earlier. Well, Tesla did not like relativity either. He was a fan of the ether. Personally, I think he was uh, heavily restricted uh, and all the... Uh, when relativity came along, the powers that be saw this as a way of stopping any investigation into the ether, which promised, uh, like Tesla did, to light the world uh, without any, any cost. So just had to set that at the outset. Um, and, and we live in a plasma cosmology universe, and that's particularly in, in, important because of something called the galactic, uh, galactic current sheet, which is uh, now upon us. So I'll try and get to some of that. Today, what I'm going to cover is a classification uh, of uh, nodes, uh, vortexes, energy lines, and, and ley lines. Uh, I'm going to look at some dowsing observations that I made and have been making for the last 10, 10 15 years. Um, some maps of some of the more major alignments that are work in progress. I'm going to show you some of these. Um, we're going to look at nodes and vortexes a little bit, uh, talk about what's going on and why this is a dynamic subject and why it's important right now. And actually what I'm hoping here today is to stimulate some of you to start doing some research in some of these areas as well because there's a lot of research we need to do on some of these energy lines and grids. Uh, and then uh, just to show you possibly the world's most significant type 4 alignment, which uh, if you've read my newsletter you might have, have come across this before, but I got some pictures and, and, and stories behind that because uh, a lot of this work happens in a, in a sort of rather wondrous way through synchronicity and feedback, which is just unexpected. So we're going to cover that. And, and lastly, if we've got some time, we'll touch on this evolution of consciousness, which is where my work has now suddenly taken a shift more from mapping uh, these energy lines and, and recognizing where these sacred are, sites are to this whole process of preparing us for this shift in consciousness, from individual consciousness to group consciousness, which is exactly what Steiner, uh, Rudolf Steiner has been, been talking about and a lot of other uh, great people in the past. So, why a classification? Uh, it improves communications between us all. I mean, in geology, we have three types of rocks. It's sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous. Most people are quite happy with that. But you can go down a bit more detail. You can 
choose different names for igneous rocks like granite, basalt, gneiss. No, that's not one, is it? That's gabbro, sorry. And there are the types, and you can go on and on and on, to geologists are, are subdividing them to the nth degree, and nobody knows what they're talking about. Uh, not even some <laughs> geologists as well. Uh, so we just, it's just a starting point. Classifications are work in progress. It's a, it's, a, it's a beginning thing so that I can talk about what I'm finding and other people can understand. Secondly, understanding our, our, uh, improving our understanding about the true nature of reality. And as I said, a relativity theory, the Big Bang, is deliberately holding mankind back and humanity back. And I have to question whether or not the narratives that we're being pushed forwards today are part of this suppression of our understanding of what's happening to our minds and our brains. And if you start looking at some of the information uh, that people are reporting, uh, literally, like they're walking down the street and suddenly they're seeing something as, like it's in a dream. Uh, and that's quite, quite shattering to some people. And there's a huge amount of mental ill health because of some of these things. And we're not talking about it, and there's no one for people to talk to about it either. We need to learn more about sacred sites and meditation, and specifically group meditation is very different from individual meditation. And we're only just beginning to work out what's happening and what we must do. So uh, we need to learn how to look after the sacred sites, uh, uh, about their differences. And different sacred sites actually have different effects and different purposes. And their effect on consciousness is something we're beginning to see something else. Uh, improving health, uh, going on from what, what Guy was talking about before, uh, when you start throwing in things like the Benker grid lines and the hartman curry grid, grid lines, and even the new hexagonal lines, which I'll, I'll cover, uh, hexagonal grid lines, they are an amplification of some of the existing electromagnetic problems. So uh, that's going to be causing even more problems. If you're living in a particular area for too long, which is one of the big, big things about this. So classifications, how do we do this? Well, in science, we have to make observations first. We begin to form hypotheses. And, and I have a, a hypothesis for what's causing some of the lines, and uh, there are other hypotheses which are for causing some of the other types of lines. Uh, once you've made hypotheses, you test these by further observations, and eventually you form new theories. Uh, the key thing here is you've got to disprove theories and dismiss bad theories. We do not want consensus of opinion in science. We need competing theories, not one with 100% all grant funding. That's my, my, my feeling about this. So competing theories is far better than a consensus of opinion. This, just where I'm standing. So looking at this, I need to tell you where I started, because when I began, uh, I, I was wondering what on earth was going on with these, with these energy lines all over the place. So I began by, by looking at uh, some of the existing energy lines, uh, in particular the Michael and Mary line. We moved up to North Wiltshire and had a chance to, to check uh, where I found all these lines, and they following up with exactly where Hamish Miller and uh, Paul Broadhurst found them. Um, but there was a particular line at the end of the, their book, Son of the Serpent. I think Brian Ashley was the, the, the dowser who said there was a little line coming off the centre of Avebury. It's in the back of the book. And uh, so I thought I'd set out and, and, and map this, and that led me on a merry old dance uh, following these lines and, and discovering uh, different types of lines apart from these Michael and Mary lines. So... Being a geologist, and, uh, it very much was about looking at the reality, what is in place. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll not map one line. I'll try and map an area and see what's in that area. So I, I spent six years, pretty much every day, coming home from a slightly different route and, and dowsing for about three quarters of an hour, just tracking these lines in North Wiltshire uh, from 2004 to 2010. And what follows are four pages from out of 40, from North Bath to Caution to Cowan to Elf to Avebury and Marlborough. And I just thought I'd show you briefly what this looks like. Um, to give you an idea, um, down here, this is, this is Bath. Uh, you'll see um, up here, uh, these, there tends to be quite a few running east to west. There's a few, one or two north-south lines um, and a few going at other different angles. So going, going slightly to the east now, uh, and here we've got um, Rudlow, um, Atworth, and we're moving on towards uh, the next one, which is Calm. I can't see it from this angle so easily. There's Calm here. And, and already you're beginning to see some interesting places. This one was uh, particularly interesting. I was mapping. And these are all on, on site. I would drive around and then walk off all around these places, uh, and often many, many times. But here there's a lovely little node 
which I don't think many people know about. And it's just off of the uh, White, Horse, uh, White Horse Path trail, White Horse Trail. And uh, yeah, one day I was driving past on, on, the, on, the, on the road. So this one here, sorry, I've got the wrong one. This one here, this is the White Horse Trail here. And, and driving along this road, you can actually see a tiny little knoll on the top of this hill. And I've always wanted to go there. And once I went, drove past, and I saw someone meditating, standing up on top of this, I thought, I know someone knew about it, you know? <laughs> so that's a, a special place. And, and that was one of the joys about doing mapping. You come across new sites. I mean, I think it came up across four or five new stone circles with just uh, where, where the lines were telling us where they were. But someone had obviously taken them down and stuffed them in the hedges. Farmers, probably. Moving on to uh, uh, where we've got eighth brick here. Uh, and, and you can just about see the red lines in here. This is the Michael and Mary lines here. I'll show you another image in a second. But what we've also got here is eight pairs of what I call type three lines. And now you're beginning to see the effect of uh, an environment all over the place like that. This is um, this, the sanctuary, yeah, as uh, Windmill Hill. Uh, there's another interesting uh, smallish node here with the Mary line. That's between the long stones, if you know, you know that. Um, so if you start looking at the whole area of the North Wiltshire, wow. you've, got, you've got the Michael and Mary line, which you know. This is uh, Uffington area up here. Uh, there's Avebury coming down this way. Devise is Oliver's Castle, and, and that's uh, Trinity Church in Trowbridge. Um, the slightly denser areas here and, and the pinker colours, this is the type of added the type 1 lines and the type 2 lines here, and I'll, I'll explain more about those. But generally speaking, you can begin to see there's a sort of a, a trend with the type 3 lines. There's east-west ones. There's occasional meridian north-south ones as well, and you've got a few looking like that. And, and it's on a big scale, you begin to, to see that uh, one of the distinctions between them is that the rarity of these lines, and I'll explain the differences. The type 4 lines are a lot rarer than the type threes, and then you've got a lot more of the type twos and the type ones. So moving on, um, this also gave me a chance to, to look at the lines every day. Um, it was standing on my doorstep and realizing this line was moving every morning. And I know it was eight o'clock every time because that's when I took the dog out. So we, we, we basically, I put a, a, a tape measure across one of these lines, stuck it into a, 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 one area which was quite kept constant, so that provided the datum, this is zero. And I measured uh, over 82 days exactly where the edges of these lines were. And the first thing I began to notice is that sometimes the, the, this line was a lot further to the south. So in this case, it was a roughly east-west line. And sometimes it was a lot further to the, to the north. Wasn't getting too much out of this, apart from it was beginning to connect with the moon and the moon's position. And there was a, seemed to be a tidal effect. Um, this actually, one of the big learning curves I'm, I'm lovely to get, get across today, is that it was only giving me a snapshot every 24 hours. When we go dowsing, we go to somewhere like Avebury or something like that, and we just do the dowsing and find it, oh yeah, it's nice, you know, I've got all that. We're missing so much. And what really made the difference was, was when I thought, I need to do it every hour. So side-to-side -side movement on this particular energy line over 27 hours. And yes, I did to begin with by, by getting up in the middle of the night and checking th this line. Suddenly what appeared, there's the datum. There's like one meter from datum. And it was at there on datum. And it was slightly half a meter below datum. I should have set datum down here. But you can suddenly see these lines had a side-to-side -side movement one way and then back the other way. And I thought, well, why has no one seen this before? It took a while to realize this, but... When you get to nodes, that's when the movement stops. It's, it's, it narrows down, narrows down. At, at the sanctuary, just outside the, the sanctuary circle, I, I found that same movement from side to side. Instead of taking you know, several meters, it was down to nine inches. Now, nine inch movement over 24 hours is really hard to, to, to spot. And you have to begin to build up the precision. So we would use, uh, even on my dowsing courses, I use uh, tape measures and get people to douse lines and check to the centimeter to be more and more precise. Because when you get started in precision, it begins, things begin to open up. Looking further, it's not far, not, not far at the nodes. So 
This is uh, actually this was the Michael and Mary line, uh, Michael line at uh, Bower Hill, uh, not far from Mo Mo Melksham, and not far from one of the nodes that uh, Hamish found. But you know, I was in the middle of an industrial estate, so it didn't really matter. Uh, but here you've got here 30 meters, and you can see that's roughly the width of of the Type Four lines back then. The width massively widened, and you can see here that it takes 12 hours to go one way, and 12 hours to come back down the other way. And interestingly, it was roughly midday to, to midnight. So I had a 12-hour movement one way, 12-hour movement the other way. This is a 24-hour frequency. If you're talking about hertz, looking back to, to, to Guy's talk earlier, we're talking about microhertz. So this is much, much slower movement than the very fast movements we were talking about earlier. But that fundamental frequency has higher harmonics. And, and they, ha they have higher harmonics at the 23rd, 25th, 4th level in the audible range. And they'll also have harmonics in the ranges that we'll be getting these tetrahertz uh, 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 gigahertz. And when you get connectivity with a basic uh, a sort of beat frequency matching other amplitudes, which are slightly higher, then you, you get this resonant interconnection uh, uh, for phase, phase interference, I think it's called. So that's the 24 hour frequency. And this one here, a typical type three lines, you can see uh, the movement was a similar sort of percentage of the width movement but this is now the six hours one way, six hours the other way. So they're, they're very clear these lines weren't quite the same uh, and not working the same way as each other. And when you start looking at the lines themselves, these are all similar lines. Again, datum here, one meter, this is two meters from datum, three meters from datum, four meters. And you can see that all of them were slightly not quite reaching the same end of time. It, was, it could be sometimes three quarters of an hour apart. And they, they were not quite reaching the same distances. So the lines were all moving slightly different. And this is just in one group, the type three lines. So what was going on? Um, and I did mention that not in harmony. What we find, though, uh, is when you measure, uh, I measured 18 lines uh, regularly on the dog walk. Uh, here there were, there were type three lines, type two lines, and, and type one lines. And this is the end of the range of one, one direction of movement. Where you've got, what I've colored them in like this is when they're the, the type two lines, for instance, were in harmony with the type threes. But every now and again, in this particular year, this is the, just before the summer solstice, and, and this was just before the, uh, the equinox, you find that oh, this was the equinox. They all came into harmony at the same time. And they only did it originally back when we started for, for about three quarters of a day they came into harmony. And this is what it's like on a graph, all slightly out of sync. Then suddenly, you've got this period of time when all the lines are completely matched in harmony. So you could call that the harmony period. So if anyone goes to, the, to, to do the meditations, which, which we run, uh, or to, are being running all, all around the world now, that's another, another conversation. That harmony period lasted you know, 10 hours, maybe 12 hours, in, in, back in 2008, 2009, when we started doing this. Uh, since 2017, everything changed. The first thing was someone rang me up and said, have you checked the lines today? And I, I said, no. He said, do. I immediately thought, what the heck's going on? I, I texted several people I knew, go and check the lines, tell me what you find. Every one of us found they doubled in width. Interestingly, the, the central band was what had really doubled. You know the energy lines that got bands? Billy Gordon's research told us that. The central band we think is connected to the solar band. So everything doubled in width, and from that point on, the harmony times started to extend, and they moved to one and a half days, and then three days. This, this period here uh, for, for these hours, well, it's now 15, 16 days long. It's projecting to be all year round harmony by December 24, 2024. What this means and what happens at harmony time, I, I can show you a little bit later, but that's just... Uh, how it came about. What was slightly confusing when it came across this was when <laughs> we didn't really understand why it was always the day before the solstice and the equinoxes. Or, and I'd always been led to think that it's the, the day of the solstice and the day of the That's where that was the special day, wasn't it? But no, it was always the day before. And that's why we always do our gatherings the day before, because that's the start of the, 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 the holy, it's actually the holy day, the Tukufa, which is the last day of the sun's cycle. So they knew about this, the ancient Hebrew holy days. Uh, now, of course, it's extended. I'm waffling on, we need to carry on. So, city of Bath, uh, this is up to 2010. 
Um, <laughs> there's a couple of people laughing in the front row because uh, this, this node here in the Abbey, uh, I, I just described this uh, actually as a broken node. Uh, when we've learned about the lines which should naturally come together into a node, uh, you find that there are, are actually equal numbers of pairs of lines have to come in. And the symmetry is critically important with regards to nodes and also helps classify between different nodes. But what you can tell here is that the numbers of, and, and the actual pattern is all over the place. And that's because it's all condensed in. Until you go further out, you can begin to see patterns. And the patterns themselves will tell you that they are different fields. You see, the lines themselves are just what we think are high-pressure concentrations of energy within a field of energy. So uh, they're different fields of energy with different frequencies. Um, slightly different lines I'll show uh, a little bit later on moon phase lines, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, but these moon phase lines uh, do cause difficulties, uh, possibly beneficial ones as well. Um, but that shows the presence of them in and around the, the, the city of Bath. This is where I do my, my courses, dowsing courses, and I teach people to track them and find them and differentiate between these different types of lines. Apart from just doing it through dowsing and through wits and learning to teach the signatures, we actually uh, take our protective shields down and begin to feel where these lines are in our body. And that begins to show. And, and these ones, they have a very strange situation where you can get them, people, different people feel it in different parts of their body. Um, and also throughout the, the timing of the month of the moon, you get different sort of intense feelings or less feelings. And strangely, depending on the direction of the line, there's, there's, there's a difference in feelings as well. It's quite possible, because nature, as, as Tesla says, gives us both action and reaction, positive as well as negative, that just because we have some, some nasty feelings, if we live on these lines for too long, it's really not good if you're sensitive people. Uh, and the nasty thing about these lines is that you've got to really anchor them. When you move these lines, they just swing straight back unless you anchor them. But uh, it's quite possible, we're beginning to think that's a beneficial effect. If you do feel a feeling in your body, it could be that's what's telling you that that part of your body needs attention. And, and you need to do some work on that. So that's something interesting to, to, to try. Um, and, and experiment yourself. Find these differences in lines. So what have I got now? Yeah. One set of lines, the moon phase lines. So the moon phase lines, why do we call them that? Uh, well, what you find is the normal side-to-side -side movement halfway through just as a slight reverse direction, and it builds into a bigger reverse direction. And it happens exactly at the half moon. That little start kicked back in that way. In fact, Keith, there's a, there's a chap that I used to browse in my early days with, ophthalmologist, a lovely chap, wonderful sentiment when it comes to dowsing, total skeptic. We must be skeptics because it's so easy to make it up. And he rang me up and said, something strange has gone on with these lines. Because this one ran near to where I lived and near to where he lived. And, and sure enough, uh, we, 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 we tracked it and we saw this reversal in direction. And after a while, we began to see it developed into full size, side to side movement again. And this occurred exactly the full side of movement again was when we had a, a full moon or a new moon. So at the time of half moons, you get this kink getting bigger and bigger. And that lasts all the way to the full moon and the, and, and the, the new moon when you have the side-to-side -side full movements all the way to the half moon again. So there's a, there is an action at a distance here affecting these energy lines. Now, physics won't, won't really like that. But if you've got a background medium, then this, this is quite possible. Um, so we call, that's why we call them moon phase lines. Um, so same moon phase lines. One of the observations I, I looked at uh, between uh, where we were in Chippenham to Bristol uh, Interestingly, this side-to-side -side movement, you might think that it all along the line moves at exactly the same time. It doesn't quite work like that way. You find that sometimes the most southern movement in one place or it corresponds to the most northern movement in the other place. So this, the lines have a sinusoidal movement. And we haven't done enough work on other lines, but I suspect the sine wave, if you like, uh, uh, frequency may be different as well. So this is over about 50 50 miles, uh, but maybe the larger lines have a, a much smoother sinal wave with regards to the, the long distance of, of when the north uh, uh, is at the north, when it's, at it, when it's at its most north compared to when it's at its most south in the same area. So we need more observations on these lines. This one really caught me for a long time, and this was in an office in Bristol where I was working, and I was able to um, uh, measure this during the day and it always goes going the same movement all day, all the time. 
And I actually had to, to work out what happened because I couldn't see any side-to-side -side movement. What actually did happen eventually when I found out, it went from midnight to midnight. And it disappeared and then started here again. Midnight to midnight. And it tends to be in the more of the meridian north-south lines. Um, what was interesting here, because it was in, in the offices, I was able to, to take a datum with the lift shaft and, and, and measure where it was in, in, in the basement where the car park was and, and on the top floor. And when you do that, you can start getting a vertical component. And you begin to see that throughout the day, there's a slight change, about, about 5 to 10 degrees. And even that vertical change would, would, would change over the, over the year. And that introduced me to vertical predictive dowsing, uh, as well as time dowsing as well, time predictive dowsing. So as soon as you go vertical predictive dowsing, it allows you to build up a three-dimensional picture. Vital. Do it every hour, and you now have a three-dimensional picture, which is dynamic of how these energies change. And that's when we really begin to start working out what's going on. As for uh, a, a theory on, on what this is, well, um, there's, there's two types of, of lines, which are, are, are broadly speaking, there's a more surface grid-like nine lines, and I'll come to that in a moment. And there's the other ones, which I think come from the inner core of the Earth. The inner core being solid uh, sits in a liquid outer core. Uh, iron and nickel is a fantastically good transducer, which means when you give it energy, it con converts it to other forms of energy. The energy around it naturally is electromagnetism, which is generated in the outer core. We think that is now emanating, or transduced into very low frequency sound uh, at the center, emanating out in spherical standing waves. When you have spherical standing waves of light, on, this was on a titanium atom, uh, you find that it produces patterns with the high pressure, low pressure, and, and that the high pressure, low pressure patterns uh, feature these uh, large, great circles with node-like features as well. So if you're thinking about uh, the center of the Earth now beating and pumping like a loudspeaker because it's getting energy, electrical energy from the liquid core, outer core, uh, we're getting a source energy providing this constant source on a surface of the Earth, having bounced backwards and forwards off all the different density, con density contrasts, that is what's showing up in these linear uh, uh, parts of the field of very low frequency sound, uh, very low frequency <coughs> vibrations there. And, and vibrations, back to my, 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 my friend's uh, theory of quantum gravity, there is a link between vibrations on the subquantum level and universal consciousness. And, and this intelligence mind. And so when we're talking about lines, energy lines, these type of lines, there is this deep-seated connection with consciousness, and I'm going to show that perhaps a little bit more later. Um, and then you could have that sort of hypothesis, the Earth is, is filled with circles like that. <coughs> so moving on, the two types of lines from observations that we look at, we can find the ones that seem to node in a single point or want to node in a single point. Those that form grids, which I think are more surface, like the hartman carey um, banker grids. Uh, uh, and, and we've got uh, everything is energy and vibration, as I mentioned, and it's all at the, at the subquantum level. So I was slightly ahead of myself there. Um, all right. OK. So um, this is where I'm probably just <laughs> catching up with myself here. Um, yeah, I think energy lines appear to have more vibrational nature emulating from the inner core, and grid lines have a more of an electromagnetic nature when they're interfacing uh, more at just under the surface of the Earth. Uh, and what we're just actually just going to come back to this because um, the sources of this, hang on, I'm going to just, yeah, I'll, I'll cover it later. So the sources of the vibrational lines. Um, coming from the center of the Earth, you've got to have a source of energy coming towards it. We've got the uh, electromagnetic source coming from, from the Earth itself, but we've also got uh, neutrinos also running through the Earth. These are high-energy massless particles. We've got cosmic energy getting through all the interstellar clouds in the, in the universe, hitting our atmosphere. It converts to gamma-ray radiation and neutrinos. These short-lived particles are enough, have enough time to pass through the Earth, and they get deflected by the interior of the Earth, and they get picked up uh, in... Uh, stations in, in, in Antarctica, like Ice Cube, where neutrinos show up as Cherenkov uh, radiation. This is giving them an indication of the interior of the Earth, uh, something they call uh, uh, acoustic tomography. So they're using sound 
and we know that these neutrinos pass through the center of the Earth. We know they're deflected slightly by the inner core. If they're deflected by the inner core, they've got to be giving the inner core some energy, uh, another form of uh, energy. Uh, the reason why we've got lots of different lines and different frequencies stumped me for a while until I realized or discovered or found out that uh, iron and nickel is a very good mechanical filter. A mechanical filter filters out all the frequencies, which is why you don't get uh, energy lines at 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 deg- uh, hertz. And you get them at 24, hertz, 24 hours and you get them at uh, 36 hours and also 40 hours. But you get these gaps. So the, the big di- differentiator, we have the largest ones, which are the rarest, only six pairs. There only used to be three, but in 2017, as I said, everything changed and three more suddenly so coming through. We think that's because more uh, galactic cosmic energy has now got through because of this uh, galactic current sheet that uh, comes back and, and, and goes through uh, our area of space every 12,000 years. The Michael and Mary type lines are the type 4 lines. They're rare. We'll show you how rare in a moment. Type 3 lines, which you saw earlier, are fairly common, and then even more common type 2s and type 1s. Um, so the differentials between them for classification purposes, the rarity, the frequencies, the widths as well are also slightly different. These ones are all wider. Uh, the movement signatures, as I've mentioned, the feelings, the source of the energy. Uh, uh, but one thing that's not different is the significance of these lines. People seem to think, well, if they're the biggest and the rarest, they must be the most powerful. Yes, but they're not the most, sometimes the most significant. S- significance here is, comes to uh, very much more the human interaction and human conscious interaction. And, and there's a great, great bit of work done by uh, um, Gary Biltcliffe and Caroline Hoare on the Bellinus line. And one thing that, that shone through for me in that book is the uh, more modern direct connection with that alignment with individual consciousness within families of people on that line. When you have that, then it, it, it takes over far more significance than any other types of lines. And, and they're all part of the same field anyway. And, and having said that, the type 1 lines, because I think the, the Bellinus alignment is, is similar to the type 1 uh, lines. There are a lot of type 1 lines, but um, the nodes, uh, and when you get just four pairs of type 1 lines, it's incredible how many times you only find that happening where there are very, very small chapels. And you have the most delicate, feminine, unbelievable feeling in those places. A completely different feeling than you'd get from the raw power of the Michael and Mary energies when they node. I think there's a different reason behind that and probably a different purpose. And, and, uh, and, and the interaction of different groups of people at these different nodes will produce perhaps different effects as well. And that's a, little, a lot more things we need to investigate. Uh, on the electromagnetic lines, the more electromagnetic lines, uh, again, they, they form grids more. So we'll just briefly go through uh, what we think is causing them. Um, the Banker grid lines, uh, Nigel Twin uh, writes quite nicely about them. Um, the, uh, they tend to be of a grid density of about 10 metres apart, and they're about two feet wide. It's the intersections you don't want to be on. They're, they're, they're a cubic grid. So they're, 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 um, if, you're, if you're working for a long time or actually sleeping for a long time in one place, you, you probably want to do something about the banker grids, grid lines. They run north, south, east, west. They're probably almost certainly connected to the Hall and Peterson currents. Now, I'll explain what they are and, and what, what the main potential source is behind these. And the current thinking is that uh, the sun's magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field interact, create Birkeland currents. These Birkeland currents go down into the ground all known, and, and they form ground induction currents. We sometimes call them telluric currents. But the north-south uh, ground induction currents that are measurable, that scientists know about, are the Hall lines, and the east-west uh, currents are the, Hall and, uh, the Peterson currents. And uh, these are much, much wider uh, density uh, than you get the, the banker grid lines, but I suspect that the sheer power of these uh, will spin off and give the smaller grid lines, like the banker grid lines and the hartman curry grid lines. The hexagonal grid lines have only just started appearing, and it's just like a hexagonal grid on the surface, but it's like a honeycomb thing. It's, it's a bit like the, 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 the basalt lavas at, uh, at the Giant's Causeway. They have hexagonal columns of basalt. These are hexagonal uh, grid lines, um, but they're not everywhere. And, and when you start looking at uh, Baynard cells and Taylor vortices, uh, which you find on the surface of the sun, uh, 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 even in, in saucepans, when you've got thick liquid and, and they bubble up, you, you find that it's natural for the currents to, to bubble up in, in, in hexagonal shells. 
uh, and, and they, they, these cells are specifically happening and occur when there's a different density or an increase in something or a decrease in something. And, and uh, on the surface of the, uh, of the sun, for instance, there's a massive increase in heat towards the surface of the sun. And they form these uh, um, hexagonal cells. If you ever looked at the pictures of the sun close up, that, that you'll, you'll see that sort of shape. So we think these hexagonal grid lines are appearing now because there's a sudden increase in energies coming around this planet because of the current sheet. Uh, um, and there's some interesting effects from uh, the center of these hexagonal grids uh, where there's a vortex action. And we also think uh, again, coming back to uh, action and reaction, that uh, although sometimes they could be seen as detrimental, I think they have tremendous positive effects when we learn how to work with them. David Cowan, energy lines, and we, David and I have spoken a few times on this. Um, basically, uh, it, it comes from uh, the work of a chap called Giovanni Grigori and, and Bruce Laybourne, uh, and they're talking about the uh, Earth and Sun and a sort of stellar transformer effect where well, we have coils of, of eruptions from the sun producing electric current. And, and Giovanni Gregory talks about the coil spines that we find with the hot spots which in and around the tectonic plates. So you have earth coils as well as you have sun coils. And if you've got two interacting coils like that, you, there's a degree of a transformer effect where uh, energy from the sun can come down to the earth. And from the point of view of where it travels, if there are spines of uh, hot spot geological activity, uh, like, for instance, in Hawaii or around Antarctica, these uh, spines will come up to the surface and they will naturally uh, flow along where the faults and the uh, magma uh, and uh, the dikes of all the, um, all the ge geological um, igneous material, which has got uh, ferromagnetic minerals in it. Uh, you will find that that, when it cools, uh, cools with paleomagnetism in, in an aligned position and that will be probably enough to cause a form of current to create the coil on Earth through old, old uh, uh, volcanic uh, lines and fault systems. And that's exactly what David's been finding up around Kreef uh, when he's been uh, measuring his work. So there's an, another aspect. You know, it's quite interesting that DC is, uh, is relevant there as well with David Count, so, um, of a DC current within that, that, that effect. Um, so moon phase lines, they tend to have different characteristics. One thing, because they can grid and node, one thing that I do want to mention as well is grid density changes and the grid vortexes changes. And I think you'll find that uh, if, if anyone's read uh, uh, Hamish Miller's work uh, on when he started measuring the Hartman lines, he found that they began to condense into two lines and then started a spiral effect. And then uh, two vortexes come off of that, and that was at the time of an eclipse. And that was when he's looking at Hartman, Curry's, Hartman lines in his... In his uh, where you're down in Cornwall. Uh, Benker lines as well, these grids are varying in density. And so when we measure them, a lot more work's got to be looking at into, well, why is the density difference and what's that mean? And there's a, just as a, as a, an interesting ob observation, I looked at the area around Rendlesham Forest, which you might remember had an old uh, UFO situation. <laughs> I've never seen such a wide area of Benker grid uh, density there. This is up to 25 meters. In, in, in the gaps between them. It's like a huge hole is opened up in the banker grid at that particular place. And, and yeah, we can only guess what they were doing there. But yes, we, and the other interesting thing about the grid density is that they do change, but we can also uh, expand and contract the, the banker grids as well now. Uh, the difficulty is you need to anchor them. Going on. Okay. So um, the type four alignments, I've mentioned they're slightly rarer. Um, Alignments, just to remind everybody, or lay or lay line, people use the similar words, they all have a pair of Earth energy lines. So if you take what you know, this is the St. Michael alignment here. The, the red dots are the known uh, fourth order nodes. And this is when you have two pairs of type fours that are crossing over. And you'll notice this is the Apollo Athena alignment and the Michael alignment here, and that's crossing over at the well known St. Michael's Mount. So the red dots here are these fourth order nodes. Uh, and the blue dots here are the fifth order nodes. The fifth order nodes are when you just, just have a, a node on one type four alignment. So you, you've got typical ones at Avebury here uh, and further up here at the Sinodon Hill and, and some uh, well-known ones at Borough Mump and uh, other ones down here. They're, they're, they're all you've known about. All we've done is classify the differences between when there's one line and, and a node and then 
two Type 4 lines and a, a potentially more powerful mode. Um, we, we've, we've, uh, in my last trip to Scotland, we just checked where these ones are up here, uh, and you can see this is a, a, a very nice little uh, uh, fifth order node in a place called Fairy Glen uh, near Rosemarkey, and that's the Black Isle. I spent many summers in my youth up there because that's where my grandmother came from. So, and and uh, all, all around this area, this is some of the major alignments over here. Um, this is going through Swinside. We've got groups of people meditating up on Sart Fell in the Isle of Man. Ballet now, got groups starting at Timoni. So lots of interesting places there. Now, every one of these lines will have more blue dots. For me, my, my role right now is to try and find these blue dots or, or uh, fifth order nodes and get people onto those sites for meditation. That's, that's the key thing. We've got some great sites along here. Uh, Ashurst Forest has got a node now, which is here. And, and they have 50 people gathering at every quarterly harmony session up there. Uh, there's another great one here at Knowlton Henge, uh, Chanctonbury Ring here. So quite a few. Um, and uh, even the one here in Coventry. So did you know there's a fourth order on a node in Coventry? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's the, it's the cathedral ruins. It's the ruins of the cathedral, yeah. Excellent. Excellent, good. Uh, and I did an Instagram post and a ley line science post today on Coventry uh, ruins and, and why we, 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 we possibly have something there. It actually goes back to probably pre-Saxon times when there was a Saxon nunnery here at 700 AD. Uh, not long after that, there's a, a, a Benedictine monastery, which has a lot of connections to these lines. So that, that's how we begin to, to just talk about the differences between fourth order and fifth order notes. Um, spanning it a bit further, uh, we can go into Northern Europe. Um, and you see the same lines here. I've been spending quite a bit of time mapping those lines in northern Europe and, and, and further south as well. These yellow ones are the emperor dragons, which we don't have coming through the, the UK, unfortunately, but they come through some interesting places. This is Caen Cathedral. This is a place in, just outside Leuven in, in, in Brussels, and I was very kindly uh, invited to do some training and talks over there. And we've got groups of people meditating on this place. A lot of people in Holland now have been... Uh, mapping these uh, emperor dragons and sending me back reports uh, there. Um, I've got friends in, in, uh, in Denmark now that have picked the, the, the emperor dragons up through here. Uh, that's been some interesting thing. Um, and they've also picked up uh, yeah, the Michael and Mary lines coming running through their place. Some interesting sites there on the Michael and Mary line running through that place. So um, more, more work in progress to be done, but uh, it's a start. Taking a bit further, looking at these larger emperor dragons, uh, this is where they sit across uh, Europe. Um, they, a bit more detail coming down through here. Uh, if you aren't aware of that, that's what we now call a first order node, where two pairs of emperor dragons cross over. This is in Mercia, just near a small town called, called Tatana. And um, I've got three people in the room who've been there with me. Four people, including my wife. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, very, very powerful place. And, and um, yeah, that's, that's been... A, 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 a wonderful source of inspiration for, for years with regards to finding out more information about these. So just, just going and looking at these uh, east-west emperor dragons a moment. Um, my wife and I did a road trip across uh, the southern part of Spain and went to some amazing sites on these two lines. It came out just uh, north and south of Cadiz here. Um, but, but interestingly, after, we, after I just started working with, the, with these lines and realizing that these things were going down that direction, it's amazing how synchronicity some, some, some comes back. And this chap called Andrew Barker, who's become a good friend, who lives down in the Granada area, he actually contacted me out of the blue and said, can you tell me why I found this? And he literally sent me this map of all these ancient sites in a line. He said, what is going on with all of these things? He sent me loads of images. Of, of these things here. And, and I, I, some of them I, I, I went to. I couldn't possibly go to them all. There's Monte Frio, beautiful little chapel with, uh, on top of this hill. Um, this is uh, Garafi, which is a huge megalithic park with about over 200 different uh, burial grounds like this. The Emperor Dragon, uh, both of them run through one end of the park and the other end of the park. And the two ends of the park, you can see where the concentration of burials are on the Emperor Dragons and, 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 and not in, in the middle of square. This is the Gigante Dolmen, the second order a dolmen uh, near uh, Ronda. This is uh, Menga Dolmen in Antiquera with a 200-ton capstone. This is La Bastida, which is where the node used to be back in the Bronze Age, 
uh, where if you, if you look at my, my Holy Grail documentary or read my book Grail Found for more information on that, but this is where over four and a half thousand years ago a group of people from the other side of the Mediterranean made this massive migration to come and live on this, on this small hill. There's no trade route, there's no water there, it's not the highest place at all, in the middle of nowhere and yet this is where the node was. Um, and, and there's a lovely old, there, there's the, the remains of the site and you can go around there. And this is uh, a few more pictures. Uh, Hypogeum near Dona Blanca, which is near, near Cadiz, Hypogeum and, and other places that they, they definitely have sound chambers running on these lines. Um, that's another picture of the um, Menga Dolmen, the Alberita Dolmen area, also one of them, and another, another uh, burial mound there as well. So there's this definite links with, from human consciousness to these lines, pr probably more than 10,000 years ago. Where are the, where are the Emperor Dragons now? Just briefly, uh, yeah, th th this is the sixth, as they found, running around, around the world. Uh, of particular interest probably is the fact that they aren't actually straight. Uh, and the reason they're not actually straight, you, see, you might think they're great circles, is that I think it's because if the source energy is coming from the neutrinos, it's hitting our, our particular dense size of uh, transducer, which is our inner core, it's got to pass through a whole variety of different structures with different densities in, in the inner side of the Earth. And we, and we know already that the inner core is not perfectly spherical. It's got some sort of differences in, in, in densities, and that probably changes over time. So I suspect uh, with the, the constant reflections and, and of the standing waves back off the different, uh, different uh, materials of rock in, in the center, you're getting a slight distortion of exactly where it is. And there's a human effect as well, which can, can move some of these lines. Uh, but, yeah, it, it produces uh, seven interesting sites on land. Uh, that's Mount Kailash. Uh, this is, uh, used to be in a place called the Temple of Viracocha at Vakraki. Um, um, there's some other ones. There's the one in, in, in Spain. And there's uh, a very, very powerful place in South Island here, which uh, Hamish and Barr knew very well, called Castle Hill. Uh, that's the first order node. We've got people now meditating there on, on, on the solstices and the equinoxes. Uluru, you know, um, and there's, there's a few others, which um, we try and get this information to the local people first. Uh, and then the other quite interesting one was the, the last emperor dragon that came across America. And, and this is uh, a project that I've been doing for three years now, is not just the, that we, we map the type five lines crossing area, but there's about uh, 50, 60 alignments crossing all of this. And I'm gonna show you one of them later. Um, but uh, at the moment, we, we know uh, we've got a lot of people who've been me meditating on, on these sites as they exit just in these areas here. Uh, so they're becoming more well-known to the locals. Um, Rory. Yep. So we're in about energy state. This is very relevant. Um, if you go back to America and study that line, right, look for how many ceremonial burial sites there are for the Native Americans on it. Um, th there aren't that many, but there are huge numbers on, uh, in and around all the others on the Type 4 lines. I mean, I've just been doing some site searches for people in Texas, and there, there's a line running in this direction down like this, almost to a place called Enchanted Rock. It's running through um, uh, the mounds, Poverty Point mounds. Uh, in Louisiana, there's the most incredible, one of the oldest mounds in, in, in America called Watson Break, 7,500 years old. Watson Break, huge place there. Further on down to, um, there's another, another mound. What's the other one? There's uh, three large mounds. Um, the Indians down there. It'll come to me. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to go down there. But yeah, that, you're absolutely right. And there's a lot of mounds in Hawaii, uh, Ohio and... and uh, uh, and this area of Illinois as well. So yes, the answer is yes, but not quite so many on, on these, these ones. And the reason being is, these aren't here all the time. No. The type five lines only uh, seem to appear when the cosmic energy gets through. And it's like the, the interstellar f clouds which shield cosmic energy, they're like, like shutting it off. And, and the Quero Indians have, have, have a, 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 a talk uh, and they, they, they talk about the gateways to the gods coming and going, the gateways to the ancestors coming and going, opening and closing at different times. So it's almost like the, these energy lines will get shut off and it, we don't see them for many longer periods of time. But right now, because of this proximity to the galactic current sheet, the whole energy of, of our environment is massively changing. 
and this is why now these things are popping up. So I suspect that this one hasn't been around across states for maybe 10,000 years, and, that's, and there wasn't many people back then. Yeah, so, so but absolutely on the type four lines, yes. So um, uh, symmetrical, yeah, the nodes and vortexes, the importance of symmetrical nodes is they form torus-shaped vortex rings. Asymmetrical nodes, in other words, when you haven't got all lines of a pair or just three lines or, or five lines coming together, it's, it's, there's, there's not a symmetry in that place, and they don't form vortex rings, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that. Uh, for a vortex to be large enough, you need a containment field. In water, you've got to have a containment field so that all the small vortices come together and build a big vortex. It's exactly the same with energy. But if you have a circular containment field and you get that through symmetry, then all the small ones can, can grow into a larger one. Um, I mentioned large vortexes here. The very basic difference between large vortexes and nodes is that large vortexes, and this is just a classification, you can come up with a better one, they're only intersections with the same type of lines. So if there's just type three lines, four pairs or, or two pairs coming through, then you're going to get a large vortex as opposed to a node. Nodes have varieties of types of lines. The big difference between a large vortex is uh, the type three lines themselves, they, for instance, have a harmony period of every eight to ten days, and it lasts for two days. Why that's actually relevant is because what we think stimulates the harmony time for the type three lines every eight to ten days is exactly mirrors the time of when our Earth passes through the heliospheric current sheet. That's the sun's current sheet. This is a wavy current sheet, and we pass through it every eight to ten days, and it zaps us with electricity. It's all measurable. And that probably gets down, hits our bell in the middle of the Earth, boom, we get resonance for two days. So, you know, the external influences is now producing this, this uh, form of vibration. And, and that now mirrors something on the larger galactic scale. Okay, okay I've, got, I've, got, I've got a slight warning on time, uh, which is the current current sheet. And we're about to enter the current sheet, which is uh, possibly when we fully enter it, we're going to get 200 years of vibration which is in harmony, which, which really gives us enough time to, to learn what to do. Okay. S smaller vortexes, these are small, shorter vortexes, typically in band, like band intersections or grid line vortexes, and they, they, they categorize a variety of different things there. But it's only when you start getting, getting combined, you get the bigger ones. So different types of nodes, first order nodes, like I've mentioned before, like Mike, Mike Kailash, second order nodes, this is just one type five line with two pairs of type fours. Third order nodes, where you have one type of pipe line and one pair of type four lines. Fourth order nodes have got no type five lines, like St. Michael's Mount. Fifth order nodes, still very powerful, like every stone circle, there's only one pair of type four lines. And then sixth order nodes, they're just all the other types of lines which don't have type fours and type five lines in. And they're good, strong ones like Stanton Drew. So it's not the type itself doesn't indicate the power of the place. In fact, the power of the place is just the location and the human consciousness and the effect that that has on the site. And that's a really important thing. Vortexes, as I've said before, it's just all one type of energy field that's in that. And, and this is a classification for, for just being able to talk about it. So if you go to the talk about Sedona, you can say, well, you know, the Bell Canyon a vortex is a type three vortex. Okay, so this is just an indication of what a symmetrical node will look like. You can see the cylinder of energy there. And, and there's like two pairs of lines as, as, as things, and you can see a three-dimensional effect. And there, the typical energy flowing in, in the cylinder of energy. You can consider this going above the ground and below the ground. And coming into harmony, the big vortex begins to form. And when it's really, all the lines come into harmony, that vortex becomes so strong, it starts sucking in at the sides of that cylinder of energy, and boom. It, suddenly you get this double torus, which is the, the top half is above the ground, the bottom is below the ground. And that lasts for the length of the harmony time. So when our energy field and our torus field is inside this part when we're meditating, which is a bit like a cauldron, a grail-like energy, uh, that, when we have resonance with that frequency, is when we can begin to, to connect the other side, uh, the universal consciousness and all the beings living in the different worlds of spirit in, in a far more efficient and effective way. Uh, and hopefully then we can learn a bit more about what we need to be doing. So what's going on? We've got a decreasing Earth's magnetic field. If you haven't heard of it now, I apologize for being the first to tell you, it's, it's that our Earth's magnetic field is rapidly reducing. The North Pole is moving towards the South Pole, and it's looking like it's going to head towards the uh, uh, joining in the Indian Ocean. 
and an opposite pole is, is going to begin uh, in uh, over the, the south. Uh, it's a, the low magnetic low anomaly that sits over Brazil. We know that's how it works because the sun's magnetic field does the same every 11 years. Ours doesn't do it probably every 12,000 years, and, and maybe, uh, probably it might only go halfway for an incursion, and may, or may go full for a full reversion. We don't know. But because the magnetic field is lowering, more cosmic energy is getting through. That's why another reason why the energies are, uh, are increasing in intensity and widening, um, and, and, it, and the whole thing's lowering because of this galactic current sheet, which, which is coming towards us. And you won't hear too much about galactic current sheet in normal science because they don't like this kind of thing because they don't like plasma cosmology. But there's, there's everything to say that, that this is true. So increasing energy intensity is causing huge problems amongst people: ill health, emotional instability. How many times are getting longer? And more importantly, we're beginning to notice, and this is the beginnings of an evolution of consciousness. So, uh, and, and this is what I think is important for us to learn more about. It. If, if we listen to the prophets, and by the way, the new science explains how prophecy can work, uh, and that's an important thing to understand. That, and what we do about it, is, is part of our learning progress right now. And our learning sites are these schools. In fact, the... the um, they're known as, 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 as places of learning. And they have these axis mundi, these, these tree of life. This is like the tree of knowledge. The, the snakes, the serpents, they're known as the instructors in, in, and the teachers. And so w we don't need to listen to ourselves. We need to go and connect in a heart-centered way in, in a state of awareness at these sacred sites, at places when there is harmony. And that's the name of the game for me at, at the moment and for everyone, I think. So more, this is where further research is needed. We need to find more nodes and more sacred sites, and we need to get people at them. Snapshot dowsing is insufficient. We need observations done hourly and virtually to build 3D understanding. It's dynamic, and it's changing, and we're still learning. So we need more people doing that. Grid density variation observations in a decreasing magnetic field. Grid vortex is changing. Loads of other things, but I want to just get on to uh, a significant type of lay. Uh, hopefully I've got time for this. this is, I was asked to do a, a, a sacred site search for a lady in Reykjavik, and we came across this place in um, the only place in the whole of Iceland cut through here like that. So the first thing was, well, wh wh what's going on? Wh why is the Type 4 line there? Um, <laughs> where's the sacred site? So you start looking for it. Uh, and that's where we got a Viking temple here. We've got a church here. And, and before I scrolled in here, I thought, well, I better check where this goes. And sure enough, it comes down through the Orkney Islands, and it runs through Scarabray, Ring of Brodka, Ness of Brodka, Stones of Sness, down this way. This, this had special relevance for me. I was taken there by my grandmother when I was 40 years, 14 years old, 50 years plus now. I ran around Scarabray with my cousin. There was no one there. Freedom. No laws or restrictions, but it was heavily embedded into my frequency. And that's one of the things that's important about it, is becoming familiar with different frequencies. Uh, so just that, that sort of held a, a, a special part. Oh, that's interesting. Follow it on. And it, it, there's, there, there is the Scarabre. There the Ring of Brogga. That's the Ness of Brogga. Stones of Seness. I'm sure you know it all. Okay. So, and there's the Viking Temple. But whereabouts is it? I didn't know there was a Viking Temple to begin with. And you start looking in. There's, there's this, this place called Grind, Grindavik. Where's the temple? I don't know. I didn't even know there was one there. Scroll in deeper. Can you see it? You go, I mean, I go in on Google Earth. I can't take trips to, to, to Iceland just to do everyone. But you know, I'm looking there and thinking, well, I had to get down on Street View to find this. And eventually out pops this thing here. Tiny, even the Vikings, they, 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 they try, they've got another thing here they could promote, but they're not. It's probably because the Blue Lagoon's just up the road. You start looking at it in more detail, You've got standing stones, arches. There's a, there's a ring here. Let me show you some more. There's a close-up. Look at that archway avenue of stones there. There's a cairn here. This is where the node is. Look at this is a Viking temple, 700 years. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. It's, in a, it's, it's in a shopping sort of supermarket area, and there it is, and no one's going there. And it's sitting in this incredible place. So that's one of the delightful things about doing sacred site search. I followed it further, and it came down this way. And I came across it, a, a node, and, it, and here, it, just to east of Hanover, and it said, in Himmelreich Road, node. 
I'll be able to say, in Himmelreich was a wood, the name of a wood. Now, I don't speak German. I thought, well, it must be a special place. I'll check it on Google, what it is. In Himmelreich. Kingdom of Heaven. <laughs> Kingdom of Heaven wood. So we call it Kingdom of Heaven there. It go, that, that connects to the Cologne Cathedral, second order node. But it carries on. The line goes down through the Gosek Sun Temple, near Larry's special place for solstice and, and equinoxes uh, uh, celebrations. But it didn't stop there. Carrying further down, the Cave of the Apocalypse in Patmos <laughs> in Greece. This is St. John the Theologian had had a vision of an of a, of a angel who told him about what was going to happen in Revelations, which is part of the universal prophecy. It was nothing to do with the line, of course, but there we go. And there is, this is the rock where he, the angel sort of spoke to him out of a fissure. It doesn't stop there. That's the line. Okay. Can you see? Well, yeah, you guessed it. It's going through the pyramids. It doesn't stop there. Look, it goes down this way. It's one, it, it has to cross a big uh, emperor dragon crossing down through, through Africa. Deborah Mitzen Monastery, second order node. This is uh, high up in the mountains. Uh, I mean, it, it's been run by uh, blokes, unfortunately, all the time. But right up here for th uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, years, they've had uh, non-stop uh, uh, meditation here. And they keep some of the holiest books uh, in this place. I think the earliest book of Enoch is here. So it's, it ties there. But if I thought that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're looking at this thing. I'm thinking, oh, it's going over to America, isn't it? Oh, I'll better check that. <laughs> so where did it go? Um, I, I, I only, only about a year and a half ago, I was asked to do a geobiological survey in, in southern Montana. This lady's got 2,500 acres of, of land, which has got loads of sort of things. And she says, can you check the southern prior mountain? So the prior mountains are very, very special. And they are, there's loads of elementals. It's, it's, uh, we're talking about American Indians. This is really part of Crow Country, part of the Anishinaabe group. And, and here is prior gap in the sacred prior mountains. The place has got loads of type forms coming through. And, and this is one of the special places there, Sacred Doorway, which is, to, I think they call it Arrow Rock or something. So that was another place it was running through, Sacred Mountain. And it literally ran right through that gap, followed the whole, the whole angle of the valley, was exactly in line with the, with, with the alignment. But then we had another connection. Have I got just a tiny finish? The Sage Node in Southern California. We, 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 this is, this is uh, literally, we were there. Two and a half years ago, my wife and I finishing on the same line, connecting the consciousness, doing, doing some uh, dowsing training and talking uh, with a group of people over there. So that's the significant lay. That's the line, one of, just one of the 40 or 50 lines crossing through the states there, uh, that way. So summary, oh, we've done the summary. <laughs> Our future <laughs> evolution of consciousness is happening. This is what we're all doing it for. The energy serpent lines are indicators of the change. Sacred sites are our schools. Steiner and group consciousness is what's happening. One of the things I'm setting up is something called the Sacred Network. We're building a website right now on this, where, which will give information to people locally on where these sites are so they can build groups, and meditation groups, and discussion groups around that. And, and then we're beginning a series of dialogues with uh, discussion groups called the Sacred Path to help build groups and spiritually multi-faith groups in, in these local areas. So the whole thing is get, keeping it local so that people don't have to go far. So that, any, any help with that in, in the future, great. But wow, no time. I hope we've got some time for questions. Sorry, we don't have time for questions. <laughs> I'll stay here for questions <laughs> over lunch. Thank you, for questions over lunch. Thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you.